If z is a multivariable function with two input arguments, then we can represent the dependencies with arrows. For each of those dependencies, we're interested in how much z changes with respect to each variable, which is the definition of the partial derivative. But there is an inherent flaw with this notation, so let's push it to the point of failure. If x and y each are dependent on t, then we can find the rate at which z changes with respect to t, which is computed by chain rule. Notice how we use the total derivative whenever there is a single variable dependence, as in the case for dx dt and dy dt. And we use dz dt as well, since every arrow eventually leads to a single variable t. But if we throw in another dependency in the second layer, then each of these dependencies are now a partial because there are paths that do not end up at t. Notice how there's two distinct levels to the dependency chain, x and y, and t and s. And it's not really fun with such rigid hierarchy. So let's have u depend on x, y, and t. And x and y each depend on t. And a system like this is very common in physics and engineering. For example, think of u as the temperature on a two-dimensional plane with x and y coordinate. Then the temperature at each point could change over time due to a source of heat or air current or for whatever reason. And the rate of change of the temperature at each point is the partial derivative of u with respect to t. And the other two partials with respect to x and y simply are slopes in each spatial direction. Now, there is an eventual total dependence with respect to t. So we can take the total derivative of u with respect to t, which has three paths leading to it. Now, what does du dt physically mean? The first term is how fast the temperature is changing at a given point. But what about the other two? We can factor the expression to make a bit more sense out of it which is the gradient of u, dotted with the velocity vector. So this tells us that the temperature could change indirectly from your own movement. And the temperature is going to change faster if you run towards a lava pit instead of running perpendicular to it. And the temperature change would also be faster the faster you run. And this was an example where we can distinguish direct and total dependence with partial and total derivative. But what if I just throw in one more variable z? Not every path leads to t anymore, so total derivative does not make sense anymore. So we can only take partial with respect to t. But does this mean the explicit partial with respect to t, or every chain from u to t? We finally ran into a problem, and we will come up with ways to resolve this issue. There are two common ways to address the issue each with its own advantages and disadvantages. The first approach is commonly used if we are working with functions, as in fields like partial differential equations and quantum mechanics. The second approach is used if we have equations, and it is more common in fields like thermodynamics and chemistry of equilibrium. So let's start with the functional approach. If we think of u as a dependent variable, then the partial derivative is the rate of change of u with respect to t with every dependence leading to t. Now, u is directly dependent on four variables, so it is a function of x, y, z, and t. And similarly, x is a function of t, and y is a function of t. So we have accounted for every arrow with some function. Now, if we take the derivative of f with respect to t, then this only accounts for the direct dependence with t. So discriminating functions and dependent variables will solve the issue. Let's write out all the function arguments on the top. Now, what if we want to take the rate of change with respect to just two paths, directly and indirectly through y? Then we can write out y as a function of t in the argument. Now, let's rewind for a second. Sometimes, it doesn't make too much sense to use different letters for dependent variables and functions. But by blurring the distinction, we're now unable to tell apart derivatives of variables and functions anymore. So we have no choice but to be explicit with our functional dependence in our notation. Now, let's take a look at the equational approach. Just like before, partial u with respect to t accounts for every path leading to t. And the direct partial is written with two subscripts x and y which means we are explicitly stating that we are holding x and y constant. And the parentheses is necessary, 
Regular subscript is commonly used for partial derivative, so to avoid confusion, we use subscripts outside the parentheses as fixed variables. In some branches of physics, things are better described as functions. For example, two-dimensional kinematics is best described with x and y each written as a function of t. And the wave function of a particle on a disk, jumping through different quantum eigenstates, is best described as a function of two spatial dimension and one time dimension. But there are things that are better described as an equation rather than a function, just like the ideal gas law. And it would be ridiculous to write down the functional dependencies of each variable. We can take the derivative of the pressure with respect to the temperature. And we can hold the volume and the number of moles constant. But what this notation really is useful for is not fixing just variables, but expressions as well. So we can choose to hold the ratio of the volume and the number of moles constant. This is the three-dimensional phase diagram of water. And each of the axes represents pressure, temperature, and the specific volume, which is the reciprocal of density. So it can be written as a ratio of V and N. Since we're not exclusively working over gaseous state, gas law doesn't hold anymore. But the rate of change of P with respect to T while holding the specific volume constant is still a useful concept. In the diagram, it would represent the partial slope along a curve of constant specific volume. Now, could we use this approach to compute something useful? Suppose we have a mixture of three different materials, then this equality represents the mass fraction of each material. Since if we add up the fraction of each component, it should add up to 1. Let's move x2 to the other side, then factor x1 out from the left. Now, we can isolate x1 in terms of x2 and the ratio of x1 and x3. In this form, we can find the rate of change of x1 with respect to x2 while holding the ratio of x1 and x3 constant. As per the actual computation of this derivative, the entire denominator is just constant. So the derivative is negative 1 over that constant denominator. Now we can multiply top and bottom by x1 and replace x1 plus x3 with 1 minus x2. So we simplify this derivative in terms of x1 and x2. So, how is this any useful? Well, we frequently study alloys of three or more metals. For example, this is the phase diagram of mass percentage for the ternary alloy made of gold, silver, and copper. Suppose that we already have some rose gold made of 70% gold and 30% copper. And we want to mix that with some silver, then the ratio of gold and copper cannot change. So the mixture is constrained on the single line on the phase diagram. We looked at two approaches to address the ambiguity of partial derivatives, and both solutions involve some sort of explicit instruction as to how we want to take the partial derivative. In the beginning, we said that if there is an eventual total dependence with respect to a single variable, we conventionally use the partial derivative to mean the explicit partial. But if the dependence is not total, then we conventionally use the partial derivative to mean the complete partial derivative instead of the explicit partial derivative. So the very notation for partial derivative is ambiguous, and it is context-dependent. And this is one of many spaghetti codes of mathematics. It would be nice if there had been separate notations for the total derivative, the complete partial, and the explicit partial. And maybe it would be nice if there was a separate notation for implicit derivative. In a system where there is an eventual total dependence with respect to time, the implicit time derivative through every spatial variables is useful enough to have the name convective derivative. But we don't have a symbol for such. On the other hand, the total derivative with respect to time, which is called the material derivative, is denoted with capital D. This is just a specific case of the total derivative, so there really is no point in using a different symbol, when mathematicians, scientists, and engineers back then didn't even bother inventing a separate notation for explicit and complete partial derivative. This is why we can't have nice things.